Truly, it's, I, I feel at home here in your midst. Uh, it was a joy last fall to celebrate Pastor John's 30 years and uh, completing uh, the New Testament, a, a phenomenal feat, uh, not matched by many over the decades and centuries. So uh, you are privileged to have a solid man of God for so long preaching the Word of God so faithfully. So I hope that uh, we can have a good time and a refreshing time in God's Word this morning. If you haven't already, would you please turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. Mark, chapter 4. I've provided you with an outline to follow along, perhaps if you like, to take a few notes, but that'll help you to follow the train of thought that we are going to follow this morning. Our Savior, our Savior is the Lord of all storms of life. He is the Lord of all the storms of life. And our text is Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray and ask the Lord's help this morning. Father in heaven, as we turn to your holy word and attempt to explain it and apply it, we need your help. I need your help, God, to be clear and accurate to what is written here by inspiration of your spirit. I need your help, God, to communicate well. And my friends need help to listen well. And we all need help to put into practice and apply principles that are woven into this passage that we may not be just hearers, but that we be doers of your word. And specifically, Lord, this morning, to be doers of your word in the midst of life's inevitable storms. And Lord, whether we're in a storm right now or about to be in one in the future, Lord, we know we need your help. We need your word. We need your truth. We need your character. We need your promises. We need confidence and calm and courage from you. So I pray that you might minister to your people, the youngest person here to the oldest. You might minister to all of us in your truth this morning. Bear fruit, Lord, for your glory in it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage is an amazing historical account of the miraculous power of Jesus over nature to instantaneously calm a raging sea with the words of his mouth. If nothing else in this text, we have a profound demonstration of Jesus' deity. Jesus is God. If I was to say that there's one take home from this text that was we cannot miss is that Jesus is God. The caption in my New American Standard Bible over this text says Jesus stills the sea. It it must have been an incredible experience to be in the boat with Jesus that night. I hope when you read some of these 
passages in the Gospels, the stories, the narratives, that you try to put yourself in the place. You know, we could just read this, oh, that's kind of a fun ride in the boat. No, this was an amazing night there with Jesus in the boat. But beyond the profundity of the miracle itself in this text, I am personally challenged and comforted and convicted by the immutable truth about Jesus that is contained in this account that has powerful, stabilizing, faith-fortifying application in your life and mine today. So you, you see, Jesus isn't just Lord over the weather. He doesn't just control the sun and clouds and rains and hurricanes and tornadoes and raging seas and tsunamis. He is also sovereign and a gracious Lord of all your personal storms in your life and mine. So this text is not merely the account of another one of Jesus' miracles. It's not just here to remind us and to teach the disciples in the day that Jesus is God. It's all that, and I would say first place it's that, but it's just as significantly a window into the heart of our loving, personal Lord and Savior who controls every storm, large and small, of those who live on this earth. Jesus is in the boat of your life and mine 24-7. I put on the top of your outline, Christians are not exempt from the storms of life. If you've been a Christian longer than a week or a month, you know this, right? Christians are not exempt from the storms of life. In fact, the Bible tells us to expect storms. Psalm 34, verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Job 5, 7, familiar to us. For man is born for trouble as sparks fly upwards. James 1 tells us with certainty that life will be polka-dotted with various trials of all sizes and shapes. The reality is that life this side of heaven is fraught with many storms. And sometimes... We create our own storms. If we're honest, I've created my own storms in my life at times by my own bad choices, my own sinful choices. At other times, the storms blow in and out. No fault of my own, no fault of your own. But storms are part of life. Spurgeon, on that quote on your outline, says, a man is seldom long at ease. A man is seldom long at ease. Isn't that so true? Is that true? Life can change in an instant. Smooth waters become turbulent in a nanosecond. And a, a sudden accident. You get a bad call, a bad news call. Something horrible's happened, a change in circumstances. You know what I'm talking about. For the, for the disciples on this occasion in Mark 4, they had just had a day packed with hearing amazing teaching from Jesus penetrating parables, watching marvelous healings. What an awesome day it had been. They were flying high. And when they got into the boat, the skies were clear and the water was smooth. And then in the midst of a relatively short trip, in the blink of an eye, they suddenly found themselves in the midst of the worst storm they'd ever encountered. And they were fearing for their very lives. That describes our lives at times. The fact is, life on this planet is not always smooth sailing. Spurgeon goes on to write, and it's on your outline there, let us not reckon upon the continuance of present ease, nor fix our happiness upon the fickle weather of this world. Let us be ready for changes, so that, come when they may, we shall not be afraid of evil tidings, our hearts being fixed, trusting in the Lord. That quote from Spurgeon is really at the heart. It's, it's the, the gist of 
my message to us this morning. That we would recognize and accept that storms are an inevitable part of life this side of heaven and that we can, catch this friends, we can and we should be prepared for them ahead of time. Ahead of time. In part, by branding upon our hearts several truths about Jesus that we learn in this short text. Jesus is personally with us in all the storms of life. He's with us in perfect love, in perfect wisdom, and in perfect power. Jesus is sovereign over all the storms. He controls all of our storms. He personally cares for us in our storms. And a proper fear, a proper, proper reverence and trust in him helps us to calm our hearts in the midst of the storms. Jesus is not aloof. Jesus is not aloof in your life or mine. Jesus is not asleep in our boats. What storms might you be experiencing today? I don't know you personally. But what storms might you be experiencing today? What fears? What perhaps turmoil of soul in your season? What heartaches? What relationship struggles? Financial burdens? Illnesses? A a hard diagnosis that you've received? What, What sorrows What disappointments? What regrets? What work pressures are you facing today? A room this size with this many people, there are storms. And if you're not in a storm right now, someday you will be. And that's not doom and gloom, that's reality of life. Beloved, Your loving, sovereign Savior is Lord over all of it. He's ultimately working it for good. I want to remind us of that. I I was thinking as I was driving up or down this morning, I was thinking, John Zimmer's preached from this pulpit for over 30 years. There is nothing I could possibly tell you that you haven't heard multiple times. But we do need to be reminded. The scripture tells us we need to be reminded. So I'm going to remind us of truth that you are well-versed in. I'm well-versed in, but I need reminders, right? Do you need reminders? Yeah. So hopefully you're encouraged. I'm just going to fly over the passage. I'm going to walk us through the passage, then I'm going to zero in on three key principles, and at the end, on the back of your outline, I'm going to give you some storm preparation tips from the scripture. So the passage, as you see, starts out with verse 35. It says, On that day when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to them, Let us go over to the other side. That day, as it says, includes everything that happened back to chapter 3, verse 20. So we see it was a very long, tiring day for Jesus and the disciples. Much teaching Huge crowds, confrontation, opposition, unbelief from the religious leaders, and even from Jesus' own family members. It was a packed day. And when evening came, Jesus was physically exhausted, and so were his disciples. Verse 36 paints for us a picture of the disciples actually helping Jesus, almost carrying him to the boat. It says they they took him along with them in the boat just as he was. I'm kind of like, like, just as he was, they're carrying him. And in verse 35, Jesus tells them they are going over to the other side. The, The parallel account in Matthew 8 says that Jesus gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. By the way, I think taking these words to heart would have helped the disciples immensely once the storm hit, right? 
You see, there was no doubt in Jesus' mind that they were going over to their destination alive. His plan was not to take them out into the middle of the sea and to drown them in the storm. In the midst of their voyage, verse 37 tells us, there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was filling up. Now, the location of the Sea of Galilee is such that sudden violent storms are common. You know this. If you've been to the Holy Land, I was there last summer. I was on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you, you can picture this in your mind. The sea is about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide. It's surrounded by high hills and narrow valleys that function like wind tunnels, which can kick up a storm in a heartbeat. The Greek word there in verse 37 for fierce is mega. Mega. So this was a mega storm. <laughs> it was a whirlwind, a hurricane, if you will. Water from the sky, waves pouring into the boat, and the boats quickly filling up. This was scary stuff. And to make matters even worse, remember, it's nighttime. Okay? It's pitch black darkness. There, this is no ordinary storm. The storm described here must have been especially fierce because it frightened experienced veteran fishermen like the disciples to the point that these guys are despairing for their lives. It was likely the worst storm they had ever experienced. They were as tired as Jesus was, make no doubt about it, but none of them are asleep. They're scared to death and bailing for their lives. Just picture it. The commotion, the chaos. What a clear expression of Jesus' humanity and Jesus' deity we see in verse 38. Because he is an exhausted human being, he's asleep on the back of the boat. And because he's God, he didn't have a concern in the world about the wind and the rain and what they were doing. He was in complete control of everything. In desperation, having done everything they could to keep the boat afloat and convinced that they were going to die, the disciples cried out to Jesus in verse 38, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I'm just going to pause right there. I, I do a fair amount of counseling over my years of ministry, and many times in my ministry of counseling, I hear people express similar sentiments. They're going through a very difficult season, difficult circumstances, and they're doubting God's love and care. This is common, very common. It was common in the boat that night 2,000 years ago. It's common in 2024. I want to put that doubt to rest afresh this morning. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We'll come back to that in a moment. In verse 39, Jesus got up and rebuked the wind. Literally, he ordered the wind and commanded the sea to be muzzled. The word hush there means to be silent. Be still means to be muzzled. Catch this. The, the Lord who made the storm stop the storm. It, it came suddenly, and it ceased instantly. This is profound. Literally, it was a mega calm, perfectly calm. Storms normally subside gradually. Around these places, they just keep going on. During the week. All right. But storms normally subside gradually. But friends, when the creator of the universe gave the order, the natural elements of this storm ceased immediately. In verse 40, Jesus mildly rebukes the disciples. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? In other words, after everything you have seen and heard, don't you know who I am? And didn't you believe me when I said we were going to go over to the other side of the sea? Now, about this time, 
I don't want to take too much privilege here with the text, but I'm thinking the disciples are horrified. The, the storm scared them, but what Jesus did really made them afraid. Look at verse 41. They became very much afraid. Literally in Greek, mega fearful. They were mega fearful. So catch the sequence. It's kind of fun when you see these sequences, get a little word study going on. It's kind of fun, the sequence here. There was a mega storm, verse 37, a fierce gale, followed by mega calm, verse 39, perfectly calm, and it produced mega fear. <laughs> verse 41, they were very much afraid. A holy reverence, a holy fear and trust in God came over them. The storm outside the boat scared them in a negative way, what Jesus did terrified them in a positive way. They were beginning, they were just beginning to fear the right thing and the right person. Which, friends, is a very important principle and belief to hold on to in life. It is the key to peace it is a key to holiness in the midst of life storms that you and I fear the right things. More importantly, more specifically, we fear the right person, capital P. And yet they still seem to be in a fog because in verse 41, they're asking each other, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They had not yet grasped that Jesus was God incarnate. He was their Messiah. Okay, there's a flyover of the text. Now I want to just extract three important truths for each of us to remember in our storms of life. Okay, and again, you may not be in a storm today. You might be headed for one, but I'll tell you what, if you get outside your house ever, and you mingle with other people, which you obviously do, you're going to meet people with storms, right? My life, in this season of my life, I do, we mingle in our flock, we mingle in our neighborhood, we have relationships with people, I do a fair bit of counseling. I'm running to people with storms all the time. So you say, well, thanks, Pastor Steve, I didn't really need this. Well, I can tell you what, you know people that need it. You know people. So you might be able to use some of the principles or the reminders of, of Jesus, who he is and what he does, to bless other people. Come alongside them, encourage them. So, okay, what we're going to look at is Jesus is in control of the storms, number one. He cares for us in the storms, number two. And properly fearing him, we have nothing else to fear or fret about in life. And then we'll end with some applications. So number one. One little blank to fill in there. Jesus controls all the storms in your life. Jesus controls all the storms in your life. On your outline there, the familiar old hymn stanza, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. Jesus is sovereign and good. This is the repetitive truth about God taught and illustrated throughout the the Bible. Absolutely nothing blows into your life without God's design, without God's permission, and without his 100% control. This includes everything, including my sin and yours, which is a mind-boggling truth. He's sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over strained relationships He's sovereign over mundane things like flat tires and diseases and mounting bills, the loss of a loved one, hard things, loneliness. He's, he's, he's sovereign over losses. He's, he's sovereign over wayward family members, the loss of a job, bad government. Ooh, that's a subject. We don't know anything about that. I mean, uh, he's sovereign over everything. Whatever the storm, our good and loving Savior is in control of it. And I remind us, the storms are not designed to destroy us. Quite the opposite. 
The storms are designed to strengthen us. And in being strengthened and applying these truths, we give glory to God. We, we, we reflect rightly upon our amazing God. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that all that's happening is designed for my good and your good? Is, is that truth, I like to say, is that truth, God is good, he is loving, he is wise, is that, is that tattooed on your soul? You want to get a tattoo? Get that tattoo. Get that tattoo on your soul. God is loving and good and wise in the midst of my greatest heartache, my greatest need, my greatest storm. Romans 8, 28, you know it by heart. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we know the good that God is working is told to us in verse 29 of Romans 8, and that is conformity to the image of Christ, our ultimate good in the storm. The ultimate good in my storm is not necessarily the replacement of the job I lost. It may not even be the absolute cure to the disease I have, my ultimate good in life is conformity to the Savior, intimacy, intimacy with Jesus, communion with him, no matter what's going on, to be one with him. Jeremiah 29, 11, it's God speaking to the, to the Jews, his covenant people in exile in Babylon. That was a fierce storm. That was a fierce storm for God's people. The familiar verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. This was given to people in a calamity. They were in a very difficult storm. And God says, there's hope. I've got a purpose, and it's a good purpose. You're my covenant people. You're familiar with the, the wonderful hymn, How Firm a Foundation... So many good stanzas in that hymn. I put here in my notes, words that are easy to sing and hard to live sometimes. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design the dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Gold is put into a furnace because it is gold. (laughs) God ordains storms for us because we are Precious gold in his sight. Jesus proved that on the cross. Although unworthy, he saved us and made us his own. God wants to draw us near to himself. God wants to burn away the dross of our sin and conform us to the image of his son. Job 23 verse 10 says, But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, or Refine me, I shall come forth as gold. But I want to be clear here as we talk about sin. Life storms are not always about just ridding us of sin. We're always in a process of sanctification, right? It's just an ongoing, from the moment of rebirth to the moment we lay our eyes on Jesus, we are in a progressive sanctification all through life. So we're always dealing with sin Right, But storms are not just about sin. Storms are not just ridding us of sin. Often, the storms are designed to draw us into more intimate, dependent relationship with the Lord. So it's not about, oh, I must be doing something wrong. The storm, I think some people make that mistake often. Oh, I'm going through this difficulty. Oh, that's a chastisement. That's just God dealing with my sin. No, it might be that. And it's good to be examining our hearts, be sensitive to that reality. 
But God is always wooing us, drawing us to himself. And I find storms help me that way. I, maybe you're similar to me, when I've got difficulties going on in different sizes and shapes, I find myself reminded more heavily of my need for God, my need for Christ, to cry out to him. So storms do that for us. The scriptures say that the nearness of our God is our good, Psalm 73, verse 28. And storms force us to seek our shelter and strength in the Lord. The disciples had no comprehension that the man asleep in the back of the boat was the one who caused and controlled and would calm the storm. They simply viewed themselves and their circumstances as random chance, uh, Mother Nature rearing its ugly head, that they were helpless victims of fate and void of confident faith that God was in their boat and had promised to get them to the other side of the sea. And so they panicked, and they even criticized Jesus for being oblivious to their plight. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus, on the other hand, could sleep in the storm while the disciples frantically bailed water because he was in complete control and he knew what was going to happen. He had also told his disciples, they're going to the other side of the sea. They're not going to drown. But for me, and I think you might sympathize as well, I, I empathize with the disciples here. I would likely have responded the same way, even worse than they did. And yet, I have the Holy Spirit. You have, if you're a saved person, if you belong to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Bible. You have the whole Bible. You perhaps have years, decades perhaps, of experience of walking with the Lord. And yet, we are prone to forget the amazing, sovereign, loving control of God. Number two. So, Jesus not only controls the storms, he cares about his children in the storms. That's number two. Jesus cares for you in the midst of your storms. Friends, God's sovereign control is a cold, impersonal doctrine if, if we do not comprehend with equal intensity his personal care that permeates all of his dealings with us. I'm, this is a, just a commitment I make in my mind as I interact with believers, especially when they're struggling and you're, you're listening to their heart cries and you're ministering comfort and grace to them, speaking the truth and love to them. I, I, I always purpose when I speak of God's sovereignty to make sure I speak of God's love in the same paragraph, <laughs> in the same context. To just speak of sovereignty does not bring comfort. Uh, there are bad leaders who are sovereign. They're in total control. They're dictators, but they're not benevolent. They're not kind. That is not our God. He is absolutely sovereign, and he's absolutely gloriously kind and caring and loving and wise. The storm intensified this truth to the disciples of Jesus' care. They had all began to accuse Jesus of not caring for them. Jesus, do you not care what are, that we're perishing? What a response. But not only that for the 12 disciples, but perhaps you know somebody or maybe even yourself today that feels that way. Does Jesus really care? To imply or accuse God of not caring for us in the storms is, I believe, a form of blasphemy. I put on your outline, Beloved, let us not be fair-weather Christians who judge the love and care of God based on the prevailing circumstances of our lives. And consequently, when storms enter our lives, we accuse God of not caring. I've, I've run into this, perhaps you have too. I call it um, people who, with God, the jury's always out. The jury's always out 
on the matter of God's love and care for them. You see, God rescues them, God saves them, God provides for them, he blesses them continually, but their attitude in the current storm that they're facing is, but what have you done for me lately? I know, I know you saved my soul from eternal hell, and you've been providing for me. <laughs> I'm kind of being tongue-in-cheek there. But what about now? What have you done for me lately? Do you really care? And I would say it's a lie of the devil that God doesn't care for you. So I, I exhort my friends, my my counselees, brand this truth on your heart. Tattoo it on your heart. God loves and cares for you. And if you need no greater proof than that, Jesus dying on the cross and rescuing us from hell and giving us heaven forever. I put on your outline, if you ever waver in believing that God cares for you, you need to focus afresh on Calvary. You need to... You need to Teach or preach the old, old story to yourself. You need to marinate your soul in Calvary. Just last Sunday, I was preaching in my church that I retired from. They gave me the opportunity to preach. And I, I, I taught on this very subject, the, the wonder of the cross, that Steve Balvance is so utterly depraved that it required divine blood, divine death, to rid me of my sin. If I ever want to know how bad I am, I need to review Calvary, Golgotha. I was so horrible that someone had to die. God had to die in my place to take away my sin, to redeem me forever. But the cross not only exposes how awful I am outside of Christ, it also explodes, it exposes the great love of God. Because on the cross, Jesus died for me while I was still a sinner. But God demonstrates his own love for us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So my, my, my take home last week was to remind my flock was, friends, you are infinitely, magnanimously, profoundly, mind-bogglingly loved by, by God. And we see that in the cross. So that's why it kind of irks my soul a little bit when I see people questioning God's love and care for them in the midst of their trials and their sorrows and their storms. It's not to, it's not to minimize the pain, all that they're going through. We should be right alongside them, hugging, you know, compassionate. But don't doubt God. He paid the ultimate price. He could have just let us go to a well-deserved eternity in hell. And he didn't. Save me at my very worst. My very worst. So, from this passage, seeing the care of God, the care of Christ for his scared children. Jesus is not asleep in the boat of your life and mine. Psalm 121 says, He will not Allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. I'm sure you probably sing that wonderful new modern hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast. I love that. The one who keeps us, the one who holds us fast, does not slumber. He is not aloof. As transcendent as God is, to the degree that he created the universe, he created all the billions of stars, and he's named them as transcendent as God is, he is imminent. He is personal. He knows how many hairs I have on my head. An easy number to count, I, not a good illustration. But he knows everything about me and you to the minutest detail. Is that truth branded on your heart? Are you helping those that you love who struggle with God, trusting God, having comfort in God in the storms of life? Are you helping them to see this? Do you take them back to Calvary? First Peter 5, 7, a favorite verse of many of us, I'm sure. Casting all of our cares on him because he cares for us. 
Our God cares for us. So I'm not even up here this morning finding fault with the disciples for their concern about the storm, or I'm not finding fault that they were bailing out water like crazy. We shouldn't blame them for waking up Jesus. We, should, we would all woke up Jesus, right? Their fault was in the fact that they did not really believe and understand who Jesus was in the face of all that he had already done for them. And that they would count that they would cast doubt on his care for them. If you're a parent, I'm a parent of six grown-up kids now. I mean, it would break my heart if, if they came and accused me of not caring for them, not loving them. And I'm just a sinful dad. What about the amazing God of the universe, the Savior, who, as I recounted last Sunday, the horrors of Golgotha, all that Jesus experience physically and spiritually on the cross to demonstrate magnanimous love. How how could we doubt? How can we doubt? That breaks his heart. So we don't ignore the storms of life. We should not be inactive or act oblivious. We don't have to put this stoic look on our face. Oh, I'm not going through storms. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. And your world's falling apart. That's not what I'm advocating for at all. If we need to bail out water, we need to bail out water. We're we're not emotionless robots in life. But we should focus our gaze of faith squarely on God and the truth of who he is and rest in the unwavering truth that he cares for us. I like what one man wrote. Jesus slept through the storm, but not through their cries. Jesus slept through the storm, but not through their cries. That's comforting to know. Jesus was patient toward their unbelief, and yet he rebuked them for it. Verse 40, and he said to them, why are you afraid? Why is it that you have no faith? I I personally sense a tone of gentleness and patience in Jesus, even as he's rebuking them there in verse 40. One commentator writes, he arose and rebuked the storm, and immediately there was a great calm. But Jesus did not stop with calming the elements, for the greatest danger was not the wind or the waves, it was the unbelief in their hearts. And then he goes on to write, our greatest problems, catch this, friends, our greatest problems are within us, not around us. Our greatest problems are within us, not around us. This explains why Jesus gently rebuked them and called them men of little faith. Even after they saw Jesus do amazing things, a variety of miracles, healings, exorcisms, profound teaching, they still really didn't get it. They still literally didn't get who Jesus was. Verse 41, they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. But again, I don't want to be too hard on them. I, I don't get it a lot of times, and I should get it. I've been a Christian for over 40 years. I'm a pastor. I study the Bible. I have the Holy Spirit in me, and I, I still don't get it. That's why I need sermons like this. You say, well, you're preaching it. Well, I, you know, if the room was empty, I'd still preach the sermon because I need it. And I know a lot of people that do. So I'm not being hard on it. It's... it's uh, the Christian life, being saved, this whole pilgrimage of to the celestial city, to borrow Bun- Bunyan's imagery, is a long process of getting it. <laughs> and then, oh, I've got to get it again. I, I, I got it last, I understood, I, I lost focus again, I need to refocus, I need to reboot. Perhaps you're like me. Precious truth number three, quickly on your outline. Precious truth number three, when... When we properly fear Jesus, we have nothing to fear in life. We should live all of life with a proper fear, reverence, awe of God, especially in the storms. The disciples were afraid during the storm. The Greek word for afraid that Jesus uses in verse 40 is the word for a a cowardly fear. It's it's showing fear in in a shameful way. The disciples were afraid of drowning and dying. 
However, the verb for afraid Mark uses in verse 41 to describe the disciples' response to what Jesus did to the storm is a different verb that describes a different kind of fear, phobeomai. One writer describes it as this, I put it on your outline, a reverence that overtakes people in the presence of supernatural power. It is a holy, righteous fear of God, something that's lacking in our day. It is a positive, life-giving fear. We don't talk much about the fear of God. Well, you do in your church because you're well taught. But out in general Christendom, we don't hear much about the fear of God anymore. Boy, that's taboo. That sounds negative. No, there is a reverential, holy, righteous fear that we should have as God's children. I like what one author wrote. He said, the only thing more terrifying than having a storm outside the boat was having God in the boat. I like that. The disciples made the mistake of focusing on the storm instead of focusing on who was in their boat. Again, when we properly fear the Lord, we have nothing to fear in life. And I find that the cause of many of my problems and the problems of people I love and try to help is that we fear the wrong things. We fear the wrong people. The root cause of much anxiety, the root cause of much worry and fretting is an improper placed fear. We need to have a righteous fear and trust and awe in God who loves us, cares for us, orchestrating everything for our good. The third stanza of one of my favorite hymns goes like this. Things that once were wild alarms cannot now disturb my rest. Closed in everlasting arms pillowed on the loving breast. Oh, to lie forever here, doubt and care and self-resign, while he whispers in my ear, I am his and he is mine. Are you in the midst of a storm today? Are you? Storms come in all sizes and shapes. Do you know somebody? that you love and want to care for. Somebody you want to shepherd. Somebody you want to draw closer to Christ. Know anybody in storms? I just want to tell you that these truths that we've reviewed, all review, this morning, are what we need. A lot more than we can put into an hour-long sermon. But at least here, there is substance, there is Truth of God and his character, his promises for us, his purposes that are right and holy. I want to close very quickly and just to draw your attention on the back of this little outline sheet. I put at the top there, I call it storm preparation. Um, Just, I'll call them nine biblical-based tips for preparing for life storms. And, I, and this is something I, I tried to teach my children as they were growing up and even as I preached to my flock, as my flock was growing up over the years, that the time to prepare for storms is before the storm. Uh, if you happen to be in a placid moment of life, now's the time to be preparing for the storms that can come or helping others to prepare for the storms that might come. So this, on the back, just really quick, consistently fill and transform your mind with the truth of Scripture, especially the attributes and promises of God. Two, preach the truth about God to yourself and instead of listening to your lies. My flesh will say, oh, God doesn't love me. He doesn't care. He's aloof. He's impersonal. No, those are all lies. I know it's worn out, cliche, but God is good all the time. It's true. God is good all the time. Three, review the gospel regularly. We never outlive the gospel, right? The gospel doesn't just get me from hell to heaven. It's everyday life. Preach the gospel. If you don't own a little book called The Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent, confess your sins this morning, repent, and buy that book as soon as you can. It will help you to preach the gospel to yourself every day. 
Four, gaze upon Jesus and glance at the storms. Gaze on Jesus, glance at the storms. Focus on him. Five, pursue godly fellowship with mature Christians. Be around people who will help you when the storms hit. Be around people that are walking the same path, want to honor the God. The Christian life is not a, a solo flight, right? You know this. It's a community effort. We need brothers and sisters of Christ. We need the body of Christ. That's why you're here this morning. That's why you, I trust you're assimilated into the flock here. Six, listen to and obey God's word. You can scribble Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, the very end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gives a beautiful word picture of the, the wise man and the foolish man and the, and the building on the rock and building on the sand. And the whole take home of that is those who hear the word of God and do it will stand the storms. Seven, remember, storms on this earth are temporary. Even if they last a lifetime, they're temporary. Heaven is forever. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Number eight, trust that God is using your storms ultimately for your good purposes in life. We've seen that. Number nine, cry out to God for strength and peace in your storms. Cry out. God loves to hear us cry. I don't think Jesus was put off that they woke him up. They called out to him at all. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes, the Bible says. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Trust your heart was refreshed, reminded of good truths. Uh, whatever this season is for you or what the seasons ahead lie, and the people that you care about. We're all right. We're all reaching out, loving others, mingling. Hopefully, these are some good truths to, to bless your ministry to other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that it is ultimate, perfect truth. It restores our soul, it gives us foundation, it teaches us of who you are, your character your promises, your warnings, your blessings. Lord, thank you that you're redundant in your word, that your, your scripture from Genesis to Revelation is laced with the promises and the, the principles that we've looked at this morning. Thank you. Tell us that over and over because we're, we're all, we admit, God, we're slow learners. We don't get it all the time. Thank you that you're patient with us. But help us, Lord, to be prepared for whatever storms are coming our way. And help us to be equipped, Lord. Help us to be sensitive and caring for people around us that need the love of Christ. They need the truth of Scripture in their, in their storms, Lord. Help us to be there for them as well. Thank you, God, for our time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.